Well, thanks for the introduction. Um, so, like you said, I'm Charles Wagner, and I'm going to be talking to you today about basically a, a look into the Celtic pharmacopoeia. And uh, I'm under the direction of Julian Dudevel and Slavko Komarnitsky. Hopefully, we'll avoid pizza related siestas. <laughs> <laughs> so, a little background information of why I chose Celtic. Um, basically, like the people of these hills, I uh, am of Scottish descent, and basically my mother's side and all our ancestors come from an island in Orkney called Westray. And this is a picture of a settlement um, called Quagro, and it uh, was continuously habited from the 9th century AD to like the 1930s. So when they came to America, uh, that's where they were living. So. So I wanted to see like what my ancestors might have used for herbal medicine. So Orkney is way up there in the orange box, and where I did my field work is in the red box, which is called Adam. And so I traversed the distance of that uh, during my trip. And when I was uh, I was at a herbalist apprenticeship to get information about these plants in Kildonan, which is a small village in the south. So basically, you can see half of Arnhem is mountain and half is forest. So there's about a thousand species of vascular plants in Scotland, and this is pretty representative of the, the whole country. So that's what I saw every day when I woke up. In the background, you have Ilse Craig, which is a volcanic plug, and Ilse Craig means fairy rock in Gaelic. Uh, the small island with the but the lighthouse is called Plata, which means plate, so plate island. So yeah, it's a it's surprisingly biodiverse place. And again, um, so you have rocky landscapes, you have mountains, you have forests, you have meadows, you have all of it. And uh, surprisingly, there's a lot of plants tucked into those rocks. So, so my major questions is basically to characterize Celtic pharmacopoeia. Besides Pliny and other people, nobody has really talked about this, especially not in the modern scientific context. There's been one uh, published review of the document that I'm talking about. So, basically, the best way I thought to examine a Celtic pharmacopoeia was through its antimicrobial plants, because wounds and fevers are probably the most common ailments affecting these people. And I wanted to see how it's relevant, like to us today, to not just do something purely academic. So. so here's an example of how Celtic pharmacopoeia is relevant. You have mostly Celtic plants, and the traditional delivery was tinctures um, and whiskey. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, and or wine. And basically, herbalists today they use many of the same plants, and they're quite effective in treating common ailments. So that's a wall of a dispensary one wall of the dispensary in Scotland. So, the primary source that I have for sort of delving into um, Celtic medicine is a Welsh text. It was recorded in Welsh in the 13th century, and uh, it could be, it was passed down to father and son in the line of hereditary uh, physicians. And so basically, it could be a manifestation of oral knowledge that could go back to even pre-Roman Britain and to like the Druids and such things. So, um, I use the Latin translation of the Welsh. And basically, that's Wales, which is not entirely close to Scotland, but it's in the UK, and it's presumably most of the same species because the text was relevant in my field work. So here's an example of a recipe from the book. So up at the top, you see, to preserve from dangerous epidemics. You could probably imply that that's microbial in nature. So basically, when the epidemics prevail, take the juice of rue, highly proven to be antimicrobial, white wine, or strong mead, drink a spoonful or two morning, noon, and night. So, and they're doing it in the absence of food, presumably to let the compounds sink in. And so, here's another, just another example. We have garlic, highly antimicrobial, sage, highly antimicrobial, rue, and again, taking a drink fast. And that, I mean, that's, the idea of preventative medicine in the 13th century, which is, you know, it's not exactly like Monty Python, bring out your dead. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so from the text, I derived 165 medicinal plants. Um, so, I did this, the text is organized according to ailment. 
So I did this based on sore throats, um, plague, cough, cold, uh, fears, wounds, anything like that. Foul smells, bad breath, rotten teeth. All these things are worsened or caused by microbes. Even though they didn't know that, I mean, it's pretty clear there's a connection between the medicine. And uh, so I managed to find 107 of these species from nine five genera, and I did that with the help of professional herbalists. So that's uh, a dear friend and teacher of herbalism, uh, Keith. He descends from a line of iron physicians, and um, yeah, he's just a, he's a master of both like practical herbalism and also sort of the energetic side of things. And in the background is a nice clown. And uh, this is his partner, Maureen. She also helped me locate these plants, and uh, she actually used to be a pharmacologist, so there is some, you know, throughput there. And she's holding sorrel, which is a good plant. And so I have the text, I have the samples that I've found. Now I need a way to test them in situ. And basically, um, Dr. Slavko Komarnitsky, um, he developed these kits uh, as a field kit, as a quick and dirty way to basically screen plants to see if they could be further validated or further tested. So you can do this in the back of your car, in a tent, whatever. I was living in a tent for two months, so it worked out good. And this is a good resource for field botanists and other people. It's qualmetric, you know, it's pretty simple. So here's an example of a kit. Um, like, this is garlic in the red, which is pretty known to be antimicrobial. And then you got, like, a um, mucilaginous plant like a mallow in the blue. And you can see like the the saccharides in the mallow cause a pretty massive growth of mold and other things. So that's kind of how the kids work. This is another example. Red you have bog myrtle, which is a resinous plant. So you know that shows good uh, activity. And you have elder, this is elder down here. And then the blue is another sort of more like sugar containing plant or even like things like nettles didn't work very well. So there's obviously fungus growing on there. So, results from the field, 63% of the 107 species showed antimicrobial activity. As no surprise to botanists, uh, Asteraceae, Amarillaceae, Apiaceae, Brassicaceae, and Lamiaceae, and Rosaceae contributed most of the species. And I mean, yeah, that's where you get your essential oils and a lot of like economically important species. So. Um, I did discover a species that had not, all these species had been characterized to have some antimicrobial activity. And so there was one that was not previously characterized, so I'll be working on that in the future. And, uh, but no previous research was conducted with uh, fresh plant material. These are all extracts or concentrated compounds. So here's some like best hits. Um, some of them are pretty unique to the UK. You have Aaron Whitebeam, Juniper, Bog Myrtle, Wood Sage, Oxide Daisy, Herb Robert, Blackberry Raspberry, you have Napweed, of course, Garlic, Wormwood, Mugwort, uh, Onions, Leeks, Sage, and Elder. So, yeah. And uh, I chose Juniper basically to validate the kits. So if you validate the kits, you can further validate the Celtic knowledge, but also just the approach of mobile biodiscovery. And so this furthers the integration of these medicines into mainstream practice, whether or not what you, you know, if it's pharmaceutical or not, it doesn't really matter. Like, it's better than, you know, a lot of things. So, um, so I use Juniper culture and staff, E. coli, MRSA, like with the gram positive, gram negative. And I did a fractionation, disc diffusion, and MIC, showing positive results for E. coli and staph. And basically, it's a proof of concept to say, even though I tested only one type of plant, it's to say that the assays worked, and if the assays work, then, or like the kits work, then probably, you know, the knowledge is on point. So, just a, a, a small impact slide. Uh, 700,000 deaths a year from antimicrobial resistance. We're obviously in search of new things. Um, new classes of antibiotics have not been discovered in a while until uh, Ticobacin, which is a uh, soil derivative, I think. And uh, so, you know, all these common pathogens are all resistant now. Even uh, artemisian is becoming resistant in certain countries, so. So what do we do? I don't know, for, for, for normal 
people with routine infections, the overuse of antibiotics is a problem. So we eat garlic. And that leads me to uh, the Anglican Medicum, which is a 9th century text that uh, a recipe for eye salve killed MRSA, which was garlic, leeks, uh, white wine, and cow bile salts. And they did this on scraps of skin treated with MRSA. It wasn't in like a petri dish, it was with like actual skin from mice. And uh, this recipe came from the 9th century. So, through some validity of eating garlic. So, questions? Uh, you, you said this was 